Blog Talk Radio. Calling all wild women. Monday, March 10th, 2014. Cafecito Break is a show produced by the Perez Sisters NYC, where we talk about everything and a little bit of everything. In this space, we chat about love, relationships, spirituality, ancient wisdom, truth, health, and more. We at Cafecito Break are a small group of awakening women co-creating and envisioning a world filled with abundance, health, love, joy, love, pleasure, and prosperity for the most benevolent outcome for all. Welcome, Cafecito Breakers. Welcome. It is such a joy to be with you again. Happy spring forward. <laughs> and welcome back, Ruthie Gooey. We have missed you. Um, we have missed you so much. It doesn't feel the same doing the show without you. How have you been? Thank you so much. I know all prayers from the Cafecito Break family have been so wonderful. Um, as you know, uh, my 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 papi has been under the weather for the last couple of weeks in fairly serious condition, and so I can happily report that he's doing so much better. And you know, every day is a new day, and so um, we're spending time together. I, I was able to uh, sleep with him at the rehab center last night and spend the night there and kind of watch over him. So I'm very grateful, very grateful for all of the wonderful prayers and the care and the love that we have received. And I thank you so much. And I have also missed you tremendously. <laughs> oh, well, it's good to hear that daddy is uh, doing better and uh, that you were able to spend some time with him that, you know, that's always so important to, to be with family. If you can, when, when times shift like this and get a little bit difficult, you know, um, and that's always a blessing. So I'm really happy that you were able to share that time with your family and, uh, um, I'm so excited to have you back. Well, we had the most amazing 90th birthday celebration for him at the rehab center. Um, that was the day he got released from the hospital. So wow. it, it, it's lovely. It's lovely to be blessed and lovely to have my parents and siblings and family and friends and loved ones. So I'm just about gratitude today. So I thank you, my dear. I thank you so much. And I'm so excited I'm so excited to learn uh, today from our wonderful guest. I'm just so excited about this show. I Absolutely. We are about to spice things up on Cafecito Break Monday mornings. I mean, we've talked about pleasure here before, uh, but today we're bringing up a very spicy, juicy goddess. Her name is Reverend Goddess Charmaine, and we will be speaking to her on the topic of sex and spirituality. You know, it's it's a beautiful topic. It's a beautiful topic because, you know, in many cultures, when you speak of sex, it's been taboo, and there is such beauty and such power that it's it's beautiful timing for us to start sharing this information and to learn somebody as beautiful as Reverend Goddess Charmaine. Let's just bring her in, and um, I've really been excited about this conversation. Goddess Blessings, Reverend Goddess, how are you? Hey, I'm great. Goddess Blessings to you all. Thank you for having me. So I'm going to start with a little bit of an introduction. Um, Reverend Charmaine was ordained by the New Seminary, a school of interfaith theology in New York City. She is a Reiki and Crystal Reiki master, certified hypnotherapist, trained aromatherapist, woohoo, and tantric energy specialist. In July 2000, in a primitive and intense ritual, she was initiated into goddesshood. 
From this ceremony, she realized that she'd been called to bring forth the unification of sex and spirit. You can learn more at www.sensuousmystic.com and www.revcharmaine.com. And we will have these links posted on our Cafecito Break page for all of you to be able to share. Wow, thank you. You you read it so well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm so I'm telling you, you know, it it for me it is a very very um important topic because I was not brought up uh being able to really freely discuss these things. And so for me, it's been eye-opening and finding my freedom and empowerment has been eye-opening, and I'm still on my journey. Mm-hmm. And I still have some sensitive spots, pardon the pun, um, when it comes to freely sharing about these things. So I am so excited about the show. Thank you. Yes, I agree. I, I, I come from similar background, and um, I'm happy that I found my path. Well, how did you find your path? <laughs> uh, that is, uh, well, you know, um, as a as a young person, honestly, you know, some people say, oh, I was born this way or or called to this, I really believe I was. There's something with me that I just love God. I love goddess. I love spirituality. So I was what you would consider, I was once called a vagabond. Like anybody talking about God or prayer or meditation or church, I wanted to go there. I wanted to experience that relationship. So I I was really into discovering new ways in people's worship. I come from a strong uh, fundamentalist background, that wasn't more wasn't unity consciousness at all, but in that I was still able to discover something magical happening in ceremony, in in, in church, and as a young person I spent lots of nights uh, sleeping at the end of my bed with my pillow on the windowsill, looking out of my window into the stars, and there was this merging that happened with me from a very young person that I felt. I was going somewhere. I was sharing in some kind of life energy. I knew that much as a young person. Uh, So I had a lot of struggles in the way that I was um, connecting with people in church uh, services. I was, um, my mom was a Jehovah Witness. My father didn't even believe in God. He said he was God. He was like, you see that food on the table? You see that money on that on that dresser? I put that there. That's God. I'm like, wow, I can be God too. And then my mom had this other understanding as far as being a witness about God and no hell concept. And I was like, well, that's kind of cool. And then I became a born-again Christian at 13, and that totally, like, they said Jesus is everything. I said, I want everything. You know? so I was like, yeah. And so then, you know, I really, like, had an actual experience with these ideas and concepts of God. And then um, and I had my, my struggles, and I would even say abuse. Um, around it, uh, spiritual abuse. I, I would. There are just certain things I don't think should have happened as a young person experiencing church with adults. Um, but eventually, there was always that ongoing calling that these people are actually in church or in school themselves. I needed to be able to look beyond the physical being and go into the energy I saw around their bodies, which started to be revealed to me around 16. I started to see auras. And... Um, so even in these fundamental um, uh, situations, I was going outside of the box. You know, there was something else happening within me. And then eventually uh, getting involved as a young person, a young girl, and being sexually aroused with our body's growth and having experiences with, with boys, I found by the time I I was involved in some kind of sexual exchange, I felt happy. I felt, even with experiences that I've had of misuse of sexual energy around me as a young person, I felt that when two people were coming together to share this kind of pleasure, I remember thanking God for it. Where does a young person get that from? Where does a young teenage girl get that from? I did, can't tell you. I didn't know that it was something special back at that, at, at that time. It just felt natural for me to be thankful to God for having this experience with this person, as if they gave me a gift by choosing to share this with me, and I was doing the same for them. And up and down throughout the years, I still, you know, went to college, came, got married, had kids, struggled, and went into what I would consider a sin life, a demonic life against my own growth is what I call sin. And I found my way back into my body, taking back my power, and then was led to what is female empowerment because everything was mostly around male domination, patriarchal uh, 
control or a list of who is more important than another. And I started saying, well, okay, uh, if, if I remember having a problem with my husband at the time, and I went to the priest because he was Catholic, my husband. I was like, okay, fine, God's here too. And then I asked the priest, I said, I'm having problems in my marriage and things, problems with my husband, and he said, let's pray for him. And that's when I got it. Who's going to pray for me? Mm-hmm. And that's when I started to shift the, the, the view that I matter, that the idea of a feminine principle never came into play except in a, in a way that, oh, you prayed to marry to get to here. There's always the masculine uh, top. And I have understanding about yin and yang energy, which I can share, but what I'm talking about is more of a sexist kind of split gender power. And as soon as I shifted the consciousness into who's going to pray for me, I then took responsibility for what was happening in my life. I then became saved, and I asked to be forgiven for the sins I brought upon myself, brought myself into my body, which added the sexual life. And ever since then, then I slowly started to reawaken to what was actually happening and planted in me as a young person and grew into becoming goddess and grew into having experiences that led me into the path. And I was given an inner message follow this path, it will bring to you divine birthright of prosperity on earth. And I have done it, and it is always manifesting itself, and it is true for me and for the 10% that want to hear me, because everyone is born with an ability to enhance 10% of the world that they're in. And mm. those that I come in contact with, may I continue to be a blessing, including with you and the work that you do. And this path led me through a lot of struggles and crisis and love and self-acceptance and nudity, I became a nudist, saved my life, holla. And, um, and so my ministry is the unification of sex and spirit um, and the uh, goddess and tantric philosophies. If that, that, it's not exactly like that, but that's the best way to communicate it. And um, I'm here. Wow. Um, I'm so, so delighted um, that you shared all that because I know that I – could resonate with um, a lot of what you were saying as a young person, like growing up and looking around you and feeling so connected to, to exploring the spiritual journey, but not feeling reflected in the places that Mm. you were introduced to go. Yes. And, and I remember being that little girl raising my hand in church, like, but why aren't there girls, altar girls? And where are the women priests? But how Mm -hmm. come? And like, I would question everything. Why does, the wife have to serve. Why does it say man and wife? And now, you know, like all these mm-hmm. questions. And I, yep. I was that annoying little girl. But, um, you know, there's so many um, throughout my journey as um, an awakening woman, um, an awakening just to who I am, to the goddessness, right, to to who is this woman and who is going to pray for me, like who is. And I love that that line that you said, I'm never going to forget it because I have met so many women on this journey who, um, for example, when you were saying that you went to seek counsel with the priest, when you were having trouble in your marriage, and I've met many women who have been counseled, um, stay in your marriage, even if there is so much abuse. And then there's this, um, almost a stigma that happens to many women when they are considering leaving an abusive relationship and they are ingrained within these very strict religious constructs that it becomes a shameful experience. Like it's almost like women get ostracized within their church community sometimes because they're taking that leap and saying, no, I'm not going to be in this relationship anymore. I'm I'm saying yes to me and yes to, to this freedom and uh, how amazing it is that you're representing that freedom for women. Yep. <laughs> May I interject a personal story that is 100% relevant to what you said? Mm-hmm. Please. When many years ago, I, I was I was married for almost 15 years, and it was a very difficult marriage. And at the time, I was within the Orthodox Jewish community. And at the time, my husband was having serious bouts of depression to the point where it was very it was very abusive. It was an abusive relationship. And so I reached out for help many times to the leaders of that community. And each time it was like it was turned on to me. 
And at one point I was even told that the reason we have marital problems is because I am not subservient enough and that because I don't cover my hair. Now, as you know, in several ultra-Orthodox societies, women cover their hair. And I, you know, I have always been one to analyze things to a, to a fault. And so I was even given a, manuscri- a manuscript of a book that was soon to be published on the, the virtues of women covering their hair and why it was so important. And so I read that manuscript, and I could find nothing in that manuscript, manuscript that went back to any kind of rule or anything from the Bible or anything basically dictating it. And I stood my ground and I said, no, 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 no. Well, I've always that our hair is something that is like an instrument that connects us to our energy. And in, in the Hebrew, the word for female God energy is the Shekhinah. And the reason all of this ties together is because the Shekhinah is that believed to be present when a couple has marital relations. So it is actually imbued within the spirit of the sexuality and the act of sexuality between the, the couple. However, when you cover your hair, it is my belief that you're basically cutting off your power. And if you look at a lot of ultra-Orthodox religions, you see that women are brought down and men have this, you know, power over them. Well, it is time for women to be empowered. That is my, my, my mission in the work that I'm doing. And so I feel very strongly that there is a correlation between allowing your hair to be free and long and uncut and maintaining your energy and your power. Well, recently I read a post on Facebook from somebody who says her husband was a doctor, and the doctor was studying cases from the Vietnam era. And there were Native American Indians that were brought in as trackers to track the enemy. And they were amazing in their abilities to be able to sense danger and to be able to protect themselves and their families and their communities. Well, the information that I read indicated that the American Indians, as soon as they received their first military haircut, their amazing abilities vanished with it. So I wanted to bring that up in context of what Rose Angel and you were saying, Reverend Goddess Charmaine, as the question also as to what you think of and what you feel about hair covering and hair and empowerment. Well, I um, hair covering from the religious uh, standpoint, obviously, um, I think is clear into what you're talking about. It is a separation between man and woman. It is a separation of power. Um, I think the hair is... You know, we have the story with Samson and Delilah. Exactly. We have, uh, you know, so many stories about the the magic or the power that is in our hair. I, at the same time, though, when I was initiated, which I'm thinking about this while you were talking, when I was initiated in 2000 as goddess, I had to be shaved. And my hair, I went bald, shaved everywhere, come to goddess as a baby, and then as I grew my hair back out. That's where the real consciousness is coming from. I believe the same thing about our monthly cycles. There's power and consciousness in our body fluids as well as our hair. I think that it's um, so. But nowadays, women that are empowering themselves are also empowering themselves by cutting their hair and saying, making a statement about their shape of their face and their head and their bodies. And I think that consciousness, when it comes to cutting hair, is just as important as those of us that take off the rags take off the coverings. I think intention is actually more powerful than what we would consider energetic cords that are antennas for our uh, connection to our abilities. And as long as we are aware of what our choices are with our bodies, we receive that benefit that was given to us at birth with our hair. I'm in a state now where about um, almost two years ago I went natural, meaning that when I was in... um, 
throughout my life, I went off and on with wearing braids or extensions or weaves. Coming from the original place first was, oh, I want to have long hair like white people or white girls. And as a black girl and a black woman, there was a lot of confusion around what we were supposed to look like. And covering our hair religiously and then covering our hair or not covering our hair and changing our hair type for messages to society that I'm okay and accepted is a very powerful thing. And there was a time through one of my spiritual trainings, I had to wear all white for 21 days and cover my hair to receive the anointing that was given to me. So when you talk about the power of the hair or cutting off the connection with by covering your hair, I could see why I had to cover my hair at that time so nothing else could be um, given to me uh, but but that what was already given to me in the ceremony had to be marinated, in a sense, by me covering my body so that I could receive the full benefit of that anointing. I had to wear all white for 21 days and cover my hair, and people thought I was a Muslim. That was very uncomfortable for me because I'm like, no, I'd really rather be naked right now. <laughs> and then they were like, you know, I had to abstain from sex. I said, what in the world? This is against my religion. No sex? <laughs> you know, so I hair and, and covering hair and cutting it and growing it, I really think first, I agree with a lot of what you said as far as the natural abilities that we have with uh, holding our hair, holding our power as women. And then I recognize over time how women have shifted the power with cutting hair as a as a statement of power and truth for themselves. And then ultimately it's our intention as to why we are doing something. Are we doing it for the empowerment and self-love? And are we doing it to to continue to grow, or are we doing it to only be subservient and and be told how to dress, how to look, and and sit and be sit behind our men and sit in the darkness and not be recognized for who we are? That's where you really need to look. And I and I uh, support all the shifts that we're doing and how a woman is adorning her body with her hair. So I hope that uh, answers some of what you wanted. <laughs> Oh no, thank you. That that really does. Um, but also, I wanted to to say that this topic is not just about women empowering themselves. You know, the the article that I was reading said that this gentleman, the doctor, actually from then on stopped cutting his hair and stopped shaving for that same reason. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so it's also for men. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, there's uh, so many. Like I said, I brought up Samson and. Uh, and for my my husband in particular, he started growing his hair probably a year before we met to make a big shift for himself consciously without realizing it. He just said he needed a change. He's my my guy is a corporate guy, you know, and he's always having the suits and the short hair to look yeah. like that type. And then one day he said, "Get this, I don't want to be this way anymore." And he just started growing his hair, and um, and it just keeps getting longer and longer, and the more it grows, the more he says, this is the real me coming out, you know. And he has so many shifts in relationships with his body, and it's very interesting. A couple of times he got pretty upset about something going on in his life or how he was feeling about something, and this is how we can tell thoughts that are demonic or whatever. He one time looked in the mirror at himself, and something, a spirit said, cut your hair. And he knew that's not me speaking. And it was very, it's a very powerful thing. I think he's very empowered by the choice of choosing to grow his hair. And now going back out into the corporate world and keeping his hair is a statement for him. And mm-hmm. um, and it's very important. And, and when we have relationships to our hair, as a person becoming natural after taking braids out for over a dozen years, it's been very shocking to – first, my daughter, when I went natural, she was like, you look African. I was like, I am African, <laughs> you know, but it it, it was from a, it was from an unhealthy program place, and now I've been able to really embrace my hair, not put stuff in my hair to make me look a certain way. But if I choose to go there, it's coming from another message, not necessarily I want to be different than what I naturally am. And for now, to wear my hair, we we make jokes about my hair be like being like Angela Davis afro again, you know, and um, all the abilities that we have with it. And it's a very uh, beautiful thing. And the man that grew his hair, the doctor, that's important for him until he makes another um, another choice. But as long as he is getting the blessing from it, that's what, how the universe reflects back to us our faith and manifestation through the ability of growing your hair and getting that message and feeling empowered and doing your thing. And that's what my husband's doing too. Well, that that's absolutely beautiful. And I just wanted just to add, on a personal note again, my middle name is Delilah. 
Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. Wow. Really? Like really, really? Yes. It really is. Uh-huh. Like your my parents name Del- you that? My parents named me that. My name is Ruth Delilah. I like Ruth that. Ruth Delilah and Tebby Guten. That is my full legal name. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's nice. I so, like that. <laughs> It's very fitting that we're having this discussion. Um, one thing, since I was so excited to ask you um, to tell us a little bit about how you found your path, I forgot that we usually would traditionally start our show with a blessing, a moment of gratitude. And would you feel comfortable in sharing a goddess, goddess blessing with us? Oh, well, this is a prayer that I always uh, I begin my services with. So I'll just, it's a prayer protection. Um, And that's actually a variation off of the unity prayer. Um, The light of God surrounds us. The love of the goddess enfolds us. The power of God protects us. The presence of the goddess watches over us. Wherever we are, the God goddess is, and all is well. Angel, angel, angel. And one more. Great goddess, please receive us and continue to bless us with our divine birthright of prosperity on earth and healing for us all. Angel, 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 and so it is. So it is. I definitely felt a shift as you were praying. It's really beautiful to um, to sit and, and just just close your eyes and listen and receive, you know? Mm-hmm. I don't know about you, but I'm basking right now. Just that. <laughs> so, Reverend God, is going back to simple, right? Can you define what sexuality is and what spirituality is? Yes. Um, well, in the way that I teach, sexuality is a consciousness about the relationship we have to our body as male or female and how we choose to share that with a male or female. Um, sexuality is half gender related and the other part pleasure so there are people that are uh, you know when I say sexuality I'm saying okay I'm a black woman heterosexual I choose to have sex this way this is my sexuality this is how I express it this is my activities and then you can go I would say beyond genital, there are people that are expressing their sexuality in various ways that may not look normal when we're looking at, uh, when I say normal, I don't even mean to insult anyone. I'm just saying, it does, it, you know, what we're programmed to believe. Then you get into uh, same-sex relationships, and then you go into what is my sexual expression in same-sex relationship. Then you look at that, that, that um how that is manifested in that relationship as far as pleasure and body relationship. Sexuality in relationship to my body is how often I am allowing my body to actually have pleasure. Sexuality is related to pleasure and expression sexually. When we think of sex, we are thinking of pleasure. We're thinking of desire, uh, horniness, arousal. So how do I bring that into my life? And when I say it's non-genital oriented, I'm bringing in sexuality through food, drink, enjoyment, massage, things like that. I look at all that as the whole family of sexuality. Spirituality for me is an active relationship with God, God is all that is. Um, I call religion more tradition. Uh, Religion tends to be uh, created based off a family or more of a long-term obligation in a sense if you would uh, if you will and then um then and religion we have a way of being that supports growth because spirituality is supposed to help us grow psychologically but so does sex and then when you get into spirituality i believe it is an active relationship with god god is all that is and not necessarily separate from myself but it's also within me and it, i also say spirit is um spirit of uh, of truth Spirit is thought and action. So how I am expressing my spirituality is in my actions, in my language, my thought, word, and deed. So it's not simply I go to church on Sundays or whenever you go and you do a ritual, and then after that it has no relationship or no conscious relationship with you until you go back into those ceremonies or outings. For me, spirituality is in everything. It's in this conversation. It's, it's a choice. It's in alignment with who I am, and that is my spirituality. 
and related to sex, it is exactly the same way for me. Because if we really would take a moment to sit back and relax in our body and in our thoughts, we need each other and we merge with each other through sex and through spirit. People fellowship with each other because wherever two or more are gathered in my name, there I am. And in that, we expand our energy field. We are always thriving off of the unity of each other. The quickest, fastest, and original way is through sexual union. So in that sexual union, when I am merging my physical body with another, I am having the actual recreated experience of God. God is all that is in that energy. And we actually really need that from each other. And we, we and this is something that is the same for humans, or earthlings. This is something that is ongoing for all of us. Even if you are choosing to be celibate, we still have sexuality. We have sexual energy that is seeking the uh, connection to itself through another and an ongoing basis in meditation and touch and food. And um, that's what sexuality and spirituality means to me. Uh, thank you, Reverend Goddess. Uh, there is so much stigma and taboo around sexuality and spirituality. What do you think is a big one, and can you explain why it is wrong? Um, taboo around sex, um, as far as spirituality, is the first one. A lot of people don't believe that you can be spiritual with sex. Like sex should be uh, con- something that's done private and in the dark and away from an idea of don't say God, don't say goddess, what are you talking about? So that is the biggest taboo, and I think what's wrong about that is that, again, leads us into the the um, agreement of separatist, separatism. You know, we spend a lot of time in our world saying, oh, that person's right, that person's wrong, and I'm not like you, and we we create this this a separatist mentality. And when we do that in our own bodies related to spirituality and sexuality, because if I say my sex is is God, if I say my husband is my God, my husband is my religion, that my body is the, the source of all life, that my yoni is in the sky, how in the world can anybody even begin to think that something like that is right? But that is the very place that we live. And I say it, it's time for us to release the, the lie that was told on us. And it is a lie to keep us small, to keep us slaves. To When we do not have power in our bodies and emerge all the aspects of ourselves, we are weak. And, and that's why we need to just take on the idea of, well, let me merge this and let me play with this for a minute to see if how will I feel if I accept all of me as a as a lot in alignment to God, God is all that is. And break those taboos that keep us separated from each other, that keep us away from love. And um, turn the lights on, throw the covers off your body, let your body be the altar that it actually is. We we look up, and if we go into Christ consciousness, or if we go into anything else, we have saints or whatever, we look at their bodies, we look at their, their human forms, we look at the things that we believe that they've done, and we worship that. But we can't look in the mirror and do that for ourselves. I can't look at my partner and do that for myself. Something's wrong there. And um, and it and it and, it's, and it shows itself in the world. We have dysfunctions on all levels. We have people that are hypocrites spiritually. We have people that are uh, have sex addictions because we cannot bring it together in the light like it should be. And that's why we're here. And it is true, showing itself and the things that I've done and people like us that are trying to bring back the merging of sex and spirit, and saying this is not a taboo. This is natural. This is who you are. This is how you were born. And um. That's what I think about that. So, so I'm electrified. Is, well, it, it, but, it, but see, I connect with it exactly. I mean, it just makes, to me, it resonates 100% um, with what you're saying. I resonate with that. What is a great first step for someone who wants to merge both sexuality and spirituality and really doesn't have that experience or any notions regarding that? Okay, that's a great question. Um one thing that I do, and I do this also in my services, is I teach a body-spirit consciousness. And the body-spirit consciousness is how do I actually think about my body? Because people may, you don't even realize it. You look in the mirror, you say, oh, my God, look, you look for what's wrong rather than for what's right. right. And so I first go into teaching the body-spirit consciousness by just saying close your eyes and just Go inside, just 
feel the sensations in your body and just breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. And then just simply say to yourself, I thank my body for being with me all these years. I thank my body for being with me all these years. Really thank your body. And what happens is your body, spirit, consciousness, you may have memories that may start to come up of things that you, your body did for you that you didn't even thank it for. That you, Oh, yeah, I get up and walk every day. Oh, yeah, I still have arousal. And my, 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 my chest is firm. You know, I have sensation. Just I thank my body for being with me all these years. My body is my living temple, and I bless it. That is one thing to start developing a body-spirit consciousness, a healthy body-spirit consciousness. And then when you get that part together, just look at yourself and say, I thank my body for being with me all these years. My body is my living temple, and I bless it. That's a body anointing you can do for yourself. And then I go, I love myself so much. That's a great first step to merging the pleasures in your body, the thoughts about your body. That would be a beginning. Fantastic. That's a beautiful beginning. So so when we take the time to do that and we start feeling the presence and feeling the the gratitude that we have for this temple that we have, which is our body, would you also say that we can speak with our body and give instruction to our body? Have you ever um, worked with that energy? Well, of course, uh, body attunement, um, sex magic, things like that. This is a really cool exercise to continue to expand the energy from our sex center, our sacred metal, to where we can actually have the wisdom or the knowledge within our bodies and then help to direct it uh, energetically through pleasure. So this is something that I teach. It's called Stop, Start to the Heart, Yoni Lingam Love. And it would be a self-love um, meditation. So I would say uh, man or woman, self-love meaning masturbation, uh, to just have a moment lying down, comfortable, and just stroking your body like feather-like touches all over your body. And then uh, get into a place where you are really self-loving and arousing your body and breathing and really just like kind of being witness to that experience for yourself. Removing yourself from the goal of orgasm or ejaculation, but just getting into, wow, this is what my body feels like in pleasure. Not that as soon as I feel the pleasure, i got to get off with it. No, really meditate and marinate in that pleasures of the touches for yourself and just say, this is the way I am showing self-love, loving myself and my body sexually. Then when you get to a place where now you are aroused and you are masturbating, you want to bring yourself to the point where you feel like, oh, my goodness, I'm going to orgasm, I'm going to ejaculate. One more stroke, I am there. And then you stop right before you get to that place you're going to explode. You stop. You do not come. You do not orgasm. You crawl your hands from your genitals into your heart, into your heart center, to your chest. You allow and imagine the heat from your genitals is crawling up your spine and into your heart center. What we do when guiding our bodies and our body-spirit consciousness, we are giving ourselves a message. When we bring up that inner fire, we bring up that pleasure, the swollen loins, then when we get very close to giving out, releasing that energy, but we stop and we bring it up into our heart. And once you get it into your heart, you, you, you stay there until the sensation to orgasm passes. You're, you're programming your body. You're giving it a message. This is what I choose to do with my sexual energy. I'm raising the vibration of my sexual energy. I am connecting the sex center and the heart. Then you do that. You rise and fall. I call it stop, start to the heart. So then after the sensation to orgasm passes, you go. You resume self-loving. You do it again. You get yourself to that point. And then you stop. You bring your hands to your heart until the sensation passes. Now, this is the real ultimate magic. You can get through that two or three times. You've got it going on because there's a lot of self-control that is very important to learn with doing this kind of exercise. And believe me, my eyes have twisted a few times trying to stop because sometimes you don't want to. <laughs> but when you get to that place and you finally say, okay, I've did it this many times, and now you allow yourself to go into bliss. 
you allow yourself to orgasm. In that orgasmic bubble, everyone, listen to this. In that orgasmic bubble, that is where you say to your body, to the energy, one or two things. You say, what do you want me to know? And let your yoni, let your lingam speak to you. Yoni is vagina, lingam is penis. Sanskrit words. Yoni, the woman would say, in her orgasmic bliss, in her yoni spirit bubble, she would say, what do you want me to know? And just listen and feel the energy in the body and let her yoni speak to her. And the man would do the same for his lingam. He would say, what do you want me to know? And you would see what information comes. Or you could choose to say, in the orgasmic bliss, you can hold an image of something that you want to create in your life, something that you want to manifest, or something that you need information about. How do I handle this situation? Because in our life force energy, all the knowledge is there. You know, it's already there. We just need to align ourselves in the proper way so that we can get the information that is already there for us, available to us. And this stop start to the heart process helps us to develop such a connection to our sex and spiritual energy that we can share information within our body spirit, within our bodies, and then use that in our life. Stop start to the heart. Stop oh, start to the heart. Yep. And this is so important to be speaking about this. And, you know, as I was listening to you speak, Reverend Goddess, um, it just like you know, I felt myself like taking a step back and just kind of just watching this whole experience with a bird's eye view, and just what a moment of gratitude I'm feeling for it being a Monday morning, and we're having a discussion on sensuality, sexuality, spirituality, and and the importance of, and, and self love, you know, yeah. masturbation, and and because these are. Um, conversations that uh many times when I was have when the sex chat would come up between the girls when I was you know um you know when the girls get together the conversation was never like this it was more like oh I did this one man and he likes it this way or like that or or oh, I don't like this but it was this is more about like exploring a lot of times as women I mean I know as a little kid like you're never encouraged as a woman to explore your body a lot yeah. of times you're, you're learning about your body through through the men that you're experiencing um, that 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 love that that making love or sex with right because for everyone is so different yeah. and um, what a liberation it is to to you know for for you to say you know my natural inclination when I merged with another human being was to say thank you was to, that I found God in that experience and that was natural for you. Whereas I remember my first experience was so ingrained with the Catholic guilt and the shame that I remember locking myself in the bathroom, being on my hands and knees, and asking God for forgiveness. Yes. I know. I know many people, many women that have gone through that. Yeah. And yeah. It's, 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 it's so... It's... um. It's beyond the shame. It, it, it's, you know, um, you watch what happens to many women, how we we start even in, in our posture, we start kind of tilting, and we're not, we're hiding our heart almost. And sometimes we're hiding our, our, our boobs because we're, people, you know, have been, uh, uh, you know, have said things to us or done things to us that have shamed us. And... Mm-hmm how amazing it is that you're doing this work because this is helping, you know, as you are, you're helping other women allow themselves to be and explore their, their sensuality, their spirituality. And and so I feel very grateful that we're having this conversation and for the freedom of having it, because we, we forget too, that in many, many, many places right now in this current reality we cannot have this conversation. It is taboo. Yep, it's true. And it takes you know, the, the 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 concept. I'm sorry. The concept of right and wrong is also something that we have tied to sexuality and spirituality in our cultures for many, 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 many eons. And so, if we start thinking about there is no such thing as right or wrong, there just is, and just go into that experience, then all of these 
taboos, including, you know, what people do in their moments of sexuality. There are so many don't do this, don't do this, don't do that, where we stop thinking about, where we need to stop thinking there is no wrong. Yeah, well, There I is no told, wrong. I was told when I was married the first time by the church that, Sex is okay between husband and wife, but certain types of sex is still not okay even between husband and wife. Like, you just never do certain things. And I was like, man, there's no freedom every, anywhere. And I don't even understand, you know, the way I've evolved is like my husband can make love to any part of my body. He can find a way in, you know, and I, and he feels the same way about me to him. And I think that when we get to a place of understand women actually taking on not only are women that are becoming sexually empowered and in that in the, out, out here in the straight world i call it consider us whores or sluts and everything we have to take that brand for a little while because people are afraid of an empowered woman and that's just because of the separation and people are harmed and it is not fair even for the men that have allowed themselves to believe that women are evil because they desire sex so much, they blame the woman for their desire when it's just a natural growth that we all have inside of ourselves. That's why we're born. But women take on that curse. And as we then, with all of that being on our backs, we still empower ourselves by the way we are choosing to share our bodies and choosing who we allow to worship at our yonis. And how we give ourselves with them is so major, so important. And getting back to just the fact that you talked about having this conversation on a Monday morning at 11 a.m., I honor you for having the power and the courage to be able to want this kind of conversation to take place. I've been doing this work for well over 20-something years, and let me tell you something. People were not happy with me, and I've I've lost friends. Uh, People told me that I was crazy, Um, and I'm like, well, let me tell you something. I was crazy when I was trying to be straight with you all, okay? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and as soon as I took back my power and my naked body, things turned out a lot better for me. So maybe we're not supposed to be in alignment with each other. That's okay. You do you. But I'm tired of doing you. I need to do me. And this is part of what we're doing here. And I hope that men and women realize that this this sex and spirit is something that the way that we practice is an individual choice. But just to have the openness to believing that, yes, sex is my life energy, it is it is just as important to me as my relationship with God and how I share that with others. I'm not saying that if I pray ten times a day, I'm having sex ten times a day. That's not what I mean. Sexuality plays itself and in, 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 ingrains itself in everything that we're doing, not just genital to genital. But most importantly, I think the empowerment of women is very, very important at this time because the sisterhood bond has been broken between us. And as women coming together to to honor each other as women, honor each other as sisters, we, we can elevate so much more quicker. And and that's something that's also important about these kind of conversations, you know, that we're having. As women showing each other the, the love that, that we miss, um, you know, that we lost. And we're coming back to that as well. And Reverend Goddess, this is uh, something that just came um, to my mind as you were speaking, uh, an image of beautiful young women that I've just sort of glanced on Facebook, uh, taking the famous selfies, um, half-naked shots. Um, what, what, what is your message to young ladies who are discovering uh, their sexuality and sensuality and where their primary messages are through, like, the music, like the hip-hop music? the rap music, the rock and roll, like there are so many mixed messages out there. And, um, you know, for me, having the background of music television, it's really disturbing to see this, um, these women artists come in like virgins and uh, sort of just get made to be like like whores. And, and forgive me because I'm not trying to... Um, uh, put down these beautiful women. But when, when you think about, like, Christina Aguilera, Britney Spears, Whitney Houston, Mariah Carey, Myri Cyrus, for example, when they started these with this almost like an angelic presence when they first initiated their careers and then where they're at right now and how that's affecting our young goddesses. Well, I, you know, that's really um, 
is so confusing because in the beginning when women are taking back their power, we either look like men or we look like whores. So it's such a confusing thing when you first when when women become empowered where we are now at first the empowered women thought they had to adopt the masculine traits. And then in so called adopting the feminine traits, the sexual power, we look like wild women that could have sex anywhere and expose our bodies. Uh, just to get the attention to say, oh, she's a powerful person. So when you're looking at the young women today, I it, it's it's even harder because we have the internet. And you know, even for raising my own children, I have a daughter and a son, and I raised them on the nude beach. Uh, they were free. And but then yet, when my daughter went into adolescence, she was faced with what she was watching, became more aware of what she was seeing on TV not just the Tantra books I'm showing her and the ceremony we did for her when she received her period. I mean, I honored my daughter as a spiritual mother, as a goddess, and I honored her as a priestess. And she still was more, um, you know, charged by what she was seeing on TV and hearing in the songs. And we went through a lot with her expression of her body as as a sexual woman with this world. And so I would say as long as we continue out here doing the work that we're doing, these women, uh, these young girls are going to quickly turn around and see, yeah, my sexual uh, presence is a power. Yes, it is. And how I share that and who I give that to is a gift to them. And it is not for everyone. It is for the worthy one. And as long as we women are continuing to heal our wounds and then stand in that goddess power, it will be an example. Because there are lots of women back in the day that still empowered me. Pam Greer empowered me. Maya Angelou empowered me. Oprah empowered me. So even though these struggles have been happening in the past with women and their sexuality, Iyanla Van Zant empowered me. I still found them. And the young ladies will be able to find us. Amen. It's very true. And you know what? I feel I resonate very, very much with a lot of the young ladies. Like, I have three boys, and all of their friends, you know, I, they seem to, to resonate with me. And I've got a lot of adopted daughters, you might say. And it is because they do they do feel a connection, and they're able to feel that energy. And it's a very giving and loving energy that asks, for nothing in return but it's it's we are older we are wiser and if we're open and non-judgmental these beautiful young goddesses do resonate and they do look to us for guidance or just for comfort or just for friendship and we they do emulate a lot of the way we practice our lives yes yep and so that's what we hold on to and whatever they're singing out there in the songs, some of the songs are real sexy and some of them are crazy as hell. I'm like, what the hell is she talking about? <laughs> Nobody got time for any of that. But, you know, <laughs> some of them and I'm then, like, Lord, I feel like that sometimes. <laughs> yeah, and then, and of course, and, and then the other part is, you know, it's just part of the natural process, like, you know, which I understand too. Uh, but, you know, for the young goddesses that are – listening to the show there are so many options and um so many beautiful goddesses that you can um find as a mentor you know like like you said like oprah to pam greer um you know if it doesn't really resonate with you take take the pieces of whomever you're looking at that that you like i mean (laughs) and make it yours you know when i first uh became goddess, um, I had my altar. This is something I think is really important. Um, Even before I became goddess, when I just went on my healing path and and loving myself, I built my first in-home altar. And on that altar, one thing that's important is altar is your inspiration. It is your portal to the higher consciousness that is also within you. And on my first altar, I had pictures of so many spiritual women cards and sayings all over my window, my mirror, the wall, the candles lit. And every time I looked at it, these images and these women empowered me to tap into that same understanding within myself that I first did not have spontaneously. I had the longing and I knew I had the, the, the cord, but the full expression of it wasn't there. And my altar with all the pictures of the women really supported and inspired me to keep moving forward in this faith. And then over time, those pictures were removed, and all that remained was the image of myself. 
Mm-hmm. And you, we can use that. We can support each other. If you feel that a person is in alignment with you or you can trust that person's um, expression, I'm not saying all the women images I had on my altar, I knew their interpersonal life. But the message I was receiving from them on the screen and what I was reading fit what I needed in my life, and it helped. 100, 100% it helped. And it, and it did, and I'm glad that you, that you mentioned that because um... – I see the way I look at life is that you can extract something that can help you in everything. And so for me, for example, growing up so sheltered, um, when the when little Kim was, you know, recording her music and coming on and scene, she was a very powerful goddess for me because her freedom of expression was what I needed in my life, was what I wanted to emulate. Um the freedom of expression. That is, uh, a lot of times um, young ladies are told, you know, to sit there and look pretty and be quiet, do what you're told, be nice, you know, um, be polite, always be kind. And there's so many different expressions of us. So uh, this is what I mean. Like, this, I remember a priest, Father Steve, would always say, there is something you can get from everyone. You know, like, you can't look at someone and be judgmental and say, oh, this is all bad. Like, there is just something that you can look for in everything and everyone and um and make it yours and make it positive. Um mm-hmm. we have a couple of minutes before we wrap up and I know that I want to congratulate you on your new show on Blog Talk Radio called The Sensuous Mystic, which <laughs> airs Wednesdays at nine PM. Eight PM. Eight PM, excuse me, eight PM. Uh eight PM Eastern time, correct? Yes. And I definitely recommend uh, our listeners to check out that show, uh, you know, so many topics within uh, uniting uh, sex and, and spirituality. And uh, and it's uh, one of my favorite things is that it's uncensored expression. Oh, you know me. <laughs> <laughs> I always say Reverend Goddess, Mother Goddess, Ghetto Goddess, always Goddess. <laughs> Oh, Reverend, it has been a delight to have you on the show with us this morning. Thank you very much. Is there anything that you would like to add uh, before uh, we wrap up the show? I just want to say thank you for having me on the show, and thank you for the work that you're doing. And and may that sisterhood spirit continue to enhance all of our lives, and we continue to be a blessing. Your path out here as a public figure like me I think is really important because in some way we are already mentoring people that we don't even know. And so may you stay in that truth and in that wisdom and that strength. And I love you for that. God is blessings. Oh, thank you. God is blessings to you. And God is you too. Blessings. And God is blessings to you. Yeah, your sister. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. Many blessings to you. And uh, check out her show, The Sensuous Mystic, coming up on Wednesday at 8 p.m. on Blog Talk Radio. And uh, the links to all that it will be in the summary page of this show. Um I'd like to leave you with um, something that I found on The Sensuous Mystic, um, which is what I'm going to call the Azuquita Pal Café Reflection today. Um, And this is um, from Reverend Goddess. uh, The Reverend Goddess Charmaine believes in the unification of the spiritual and the physical. To deny that we are sexual beings is to deny our very humanity. In her work, she seeks to enlighten and empower those affected by both societal and sexual issues through spiritual guidance and sexual counseling where needed. While her approach is perhaps unorthodox in some people's views, it is for the betterment of society in general that her work is conducted. If lives are based on shame and fear, we cannot grow as God's children and become healthy, happy, and productive members of our society. Oh, my God. I got chills. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you again, Reverend Goddess, um, for being with us on the show. Thank you both. You both are wonderful, and I am so grateful to have shared this time with both of you. Thanks. Have a great Monday. Thank you. Thank you. And, Ruthie, thank you. It's great to have you back. And lastly, I'd like to give a shout-out to my beautiful sister, Alice. Uh, Thank you for your questions. She is such a great producer behind the scenes. And today is her birthday. Happy birthday, birthday. Three years apart. We're like twins. Uh, happy birthday, dear sister. I love you. Um, thank you, Gafito Breakers, for listening to the show, for show suggestions. 
and any comments, feel free to check us out. I got to take a break. And why see a This has been Rosalia Perez and Ruthie Gu and reminding you to feel good. Have a great week.